But I also wanted to make the case, and there are many people who would challenge it, that the world in the last half century became a single society for the first time. This it matters quite a lot to me. I mean, I understand that uh, globalization, the sense that we're growing closer together, has occurred before in history. I mean, people like Immanuel Kant, living in the context of uh, the French Revolution and the abolition of slavery and so on, believed uh, that they were uh, party to a rapid shrinking of the world and its increasing unification. I mean, the period of greatest international migration ever was in the three decades or so before the First World War, uh, so, uh, which was clearly another period of uh, globalization. So there are plenty of people who will tell you that there's nothing new about globalization, about the idea that um, the world is uh, coming closer together. But uh, my, my argument is, is, is that uh, uh, there, have been, there has been a kind of qualitative difference. I mean, after all, it's only since the 1960s that we first saw the world from the outside as a result of the space race. It's an image that you probably take for granted, but it was astonishing at the time that we can actually see ourselves in space, the world. And, that, uh, and the, I, I do I put a lot of my uh, bets, if you like, as an intellectual and in politics on the notion that the internet and the associated digital technologies um, provide us with new means for making society that we need to learn about and insert ourselves into uh, uh, in order to be uh, more effective. And I, I, I would actually say that the claim that recently the world became unified for the first time uh, rests on three uh, 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 developments. Uh, one of them is the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, 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 which, which opened up the world to transnational capitalism and neoliberal policies. Uh, more or less for the first time. The second <laughs> is the emergence of India and China as major economic players in the world for the first time. I believe that we are living through a period in which for the first time American and European dominance of world capitalism cannot be taken for granted, even more so after the events of this last couple of years. Um, and the third, uh, 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 the third uh, um, development is the rise of the internet, the, the uh, colossal abbreviation of time and space that that has uh, brought about. Um, so my argument is that, is that we are, uh, to a degree that is new, making a world society today and that the engine driving that uh, world society, certainly in the last three decades, was what we call neoliberal capitalism. Uh, that mechanism is clearly in an advanced state of disrepair at the moment. Uh, there are various possibilities. We may, the world may regress uh, to um, a general depression and the state of war in which fragmentation is more normal than the idea of integration. Uh, but I'm betting that uh, whatever the calamities that we face, uh, uh, they will in a significant degree only be uh, uh, um, adequately addressed at the global level. Not exclusively at the global level, but at that level importantly. And so, uh, for me, uh, as an engaged uh, anthropologist, the task is how could anthropology contribute to the making of a world society that is more democratic than any that we have known? In other words, it's the same question that the Enlightenment, the liberal Enlightenment posed, uh, but it's set again uh, in, in our history rather than theirs. Uh, I believe that, the, you know, that, that, that uh, disciplines, uh, branches of knowledge are uh, stronger when the, the questions that they're addressing are very clear. And I think that, 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 that one of the measures of how far academic anthropology today has departed from such clarity 
is that in its heyday, when the ethnographic movement, for example, in Britain, established a social anthropology that was incredibly vital and new, uh, there was a clear relationship between the uh, object, theory, and method of that social anthropology. The, the object of that anthropology was the sociology of primitive societies. The theory was functionalism which is, you know, people do what they do because it works for them. So let's see how it works for them. And the method was ethno fieldwork-based ethnography. Go and live with them, see how it works for them. So the object, theory, and method, when, in, when, when social anthropology in this country was formed, uh, 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 was extremely coherent. Uh, but since then, I mean, we have abandoned the object, we no longer study uh, primitive societies, although it's not clear what it is we do study. We've certainly abandoned functionalism as a theory, but it's not clear whether we have replaced it with anything. And what we cling to is the idea of fieldwork-based ethnography as a kind of mantra guaranteeing our professional continuity. And I think that this uh, won't do, really. I mean, what we need is an object and a theory and a method that add up to something coherent. And as far as I'm concerned, anthropology would benefit from making its object uh, uh, the making of world society. In other words, what do we need to know about humanity as a whole that would further the aspiration to form a world society on a more equal and democratic footing than anything hitherto known? So that would be the object for me. Um, since we're in the middle of all this, I can't actually sort of offer you at the moment the, in, in, in a two-word uh, phrase, maybe if I work on Twitter a bit longer, I'll get round to it. Uh, but uh, but my, my, at the moment, I'm prepared to accept theoretical eclecticism. I mean, uh, my, my feeling is, 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 that, uh, is, is, is that we should look at anthropology's history and draw eclectically from those parts of it that we find to be uh, valid. I mean, the ethnographic, the world historical, the philosophical, whatever. Uh, the method, it seems to me, must uh, arise out of uh, uh, some kind of synthesis of philosophy, history, and ethnography. Uh, but it will also, I believe, have certain qualities, new qualities, that have not traditionally ever been part of anthropology, but which will become important in response to the questions we address in the society that we live in. And I'll try to uh, explain that. The, 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 the main... Um, so, what was the digital revolution in communications. I'm claiming that that is the matrix through which we should explain and understand ourselves. I mean, it was one of a series of uh, such revolutions in the history of modern capitalism in which a commodity was radically cheapened. I mean, in the first industrial revolution, clothing and textiles were radically cheapened as commodities in Manchester and Leeds and so forth. Uh, and, that, and that radical cheapening of uh, the means of clothing uh, was, was the, the, the driving force of the first stage of the uh, Industrial Revolution. Um, the, electri the electricity re uh, revolution was basically about cheapening the sources of energy in, at work and at home. Uh, so what was it that was being cheapened in the digital revolution that we're going through at the moment. What the commodity which has been radically cheapened is uh, the transfer of information. So the transfer of information is now so much cheaper that it changes the relationship, I believe, between persons uh, and society, between long distance exchanges and more local and intimate ones. 